Welcome ladies and gentlemen to this fourth video in my series on the murder of Inga Lotz. In order to keep the video short, I've decided to break episode four into three parts. Now episode four in its in totality will deal with the investigations by the police as well as the private investigators from between the murder and April the 12th. Now, April the 12th is a very important date in this case and you'll come to understand why a little bit later. But let's look at the, uh, how the police was set up at the time. Now the Shiraz complex is located in the area of the Klutusville police station, which is adjacent to the much larger Stellenbosch area. Now each police station has a uniform branch. These are the officers that do patrolling in their vehicles and, are the, and that are the first responders to incidents that are called in. So when attending to a crime scene, a first responder has several duties and it depends on the crime scene, obviously. In the case of a suspected suicide or a murder, the first duty of a first responder is to check on the condition of the victim and to provide any medical assistance that may be required and to call for an ambulance, even if the victim appears deceased, because that can only be confirmed by a medical professional that has the authority to issue a death certificate. So if there are no suspects to pursue, as it was in this case, the next duty of the first responder would be to secure the crime scene. Now, in most cases, this would involve cordoning off the crime scene of crime scene tape and to ensure that no unauthorized persons goes beyond the tape. Then the first responder is responsible to make calls to ensure that the suitably qualified person arrives to take over the management of the crime scene. In most cases, that would be the duty detective. And it is the detective then that decides who can enter the crime scene. And it's also the detective's duty to call the necessary crime scene investigators and forensic specialists to start the processing of the crime scene, to look for and to collect evidence. Now each police station does not have their own crime scene investigators. Basic crime scene investigation services such as fingerprinting, photography, videotaping, making sketch plans, etc. are provided by a centralized local criminal record center, LCRC. And the critical station was within the area of the PAL LCRC. Then there's also a, a provincial LCRC who can undertake more sophisticated investigations that the local LCRCs are not equipped to undertake. Now, after Christopher Pistorius found Inga's body, he asked Andre Builders, a resident in the Giraus complex, to call the police. And Andre Builders called the Stellenbosch police station, not the Klutusville station. And the phone at the Stellenbosch station was answered by a Captain Franz September, who was the shift commander that night. Andre Builders told him that someone committed suicide at the Shiraz complex in Kleine Valkenfonden. Now, because the complex was in the jurisdictional area of the Klutusville police station, Captain September called and reported the call to Klutusville police station. But as there were no duty officers uh, available at that time, because they were all out in other calls, Captain September decided to go to Shiraz himself. And when he got there, he was met by Christopher Turias and outside, who then took him up and showed him where Inga's flight was. So at this time, Captain September was the first responder. And he entered the, the flat and he assessed the crime scene and determined that uh, Inga was dead and that she did not commit suicide, that it was murder. And while he was upstairs doing that, a second person arrived, Sergeant Carson, from the Kutisville police station. And he was on routine, routine patrol that, uh, that evening when he heard about the suicide at the Shiraz complex on the radio. He responded to the call and when he arrived at the flat, 
uh, a white male person. Uh, I assume it was Christo Couturis showed him up to the plat. And when he got there, he met up with uh, Captain September and both of them again went through the crime scene and they both came to the conclusion that Inge did not commit suicide and that she was murdered. Now, as first responders, obviously they had attitude, they needed to call somebody to come take control of the crime scene. They also had to call the ambulance, per, uh, the ambulance people to come and assess whether Inge was really dead and to issue a death certificate. Uh, to this end, Sergeant Clausen called Inspector Joseph Mathibi, the, the duty officer at the Clutusville Police Station, informed him that uh, it wasn't uh, a suicide, but it was murder, and that uh, an ambulance needs to be dispatched, as well as a call needs to be made to the duty detective. So now that an ambulance and the duty detective have been called, the next duty of these first responders was to secure the crime scene. But it seems that neither September nor Klaassen had crime scene tape with them. Uh, so September called uh, a Captain Bertus Prince, who together with Sergeant Mark Cornell were doing patrol duty in the Stellenbosch area. And September asked them to bring crime scene tape to uh, the crime scene at, at to the Saraj complex. Uh, before the arrival of Prince and of the crime scene tape, two members of the Stellenbosch uh, ambulance service arrived, as well as Inspector Mustibi, accompanied by two student constables. Now it seems that September and class as the first responders did not do a good job of keeping the crime scene secure, because when Prince and Nell arrived there, they found seven people inside the flat, standing mostly in the kitchen area. There were two from the ambulance service by Inge's body and five police officers, September, Klaassen, Mutibi, and the two student constables. Now it was the, the ambulance person, uh, Hilden Heldenes, who declared Inge dead and issued a, a death certificate, which he then handed to Sergeant Klaassen. Now, according to Sergeant Clausen, at that time, his duty was to keep the crime scene secure in the sense that he, sh that he needed to make sure that nobody touches anything or move things around. But in, in my personal opinion, after September and Clausen, the, the ambulance person, Hilden Helden, I should have been only the third person to enter the flat that evening. He didn't need a second medic nor an audience of five police officers for him to do his job. So when Prince and Nell arrived, so instead of just putting up the tape and leaving, they first conducted their own inspection of the flat. Now keep in mind, they were patrol officers from a different jurisdiction. They were not detectives nor crime scene investigators. And first they went into the bathroom to look through the window to see if they could see any weapons that had been discarded. And then they went into the living room, opened the curtain of the balcony door, and saw that the security gate was still in place and undisturbed. Only thereafter, they put up the crime scene tape between the handle of the office door and the kitchen sink, leaving part of the kitchen area open and unprotected. It seems that they've also put Take by the stairs leading up to Inga's flat and all around Inga's car. They also conducted a search outside the building to look for discarded weapons, but they, they didn't find anything. So then finally, at some stage, and possibly too late, the duty detective, Detective Constable Alfiso Adams, arrived and took charge of the crime scene. So earlier, when Captain September called Prince and Nell to bring the, the, crimes, the crime scene tape. He also called a detective from the Stellenbosch station uh, called Captain Estelle Benjamin. And he asked her to come to the crime scene. And when she arrived, she found that Detective Constable Adams uh, was already in charge. And she went up to the flat, of course, to inspect the scene for herself. Why not? 
and she saw that the crime scene tape was already up and she found Klaassen and a detective constable inside the flat and she asked him to leave. Uh, there was no reason for them to be there. Thereafter, she called uh, a superintendent, a senior superintendent, Perry, uh, the chief detective for the Bulland area. And after that, she then advised Adams on who she should contact, such as, for example, the crime scene investigators and photographers. So I get a, a, a sense here that Detective Constable Adams perhaps wasn't very experienced and that Captain Benjamin decided to provide some guidance and assistance on, on what to do next. The first crime scene investigator to arrive was Constable Elton Swartz, who worked for the LCRC in Powell. And when he got there, he first reported, as he should, to Constable Adams, who showed him through the crime scene. Now, Swartz then waited for the crime scene photographer to arrive and Inspector Desmond Scher. And between the two of them, they decided to call their duty officer, uh, Captain Andres Matias. And he arrived about 30 minutes later. Now, following another inspection of the crime scene, a joint decision was made to call somebody from the Provincial Crime Scene Investigation Team. And a call was made to Superintendent Bruce Bartholomew. Now, in the meantime, at about midnight, another detective from Crittersville arrived, an Inspector Raymond Peterson. He met with Detective Constable Adams, who showed him through the crime scene, and I assume that as Peterson was more senior than Adams, he took control of the crime scene thereafter. So while the crime scene investigators were waiting for Superintendent Bruce Bartholomew to arrive, Peterson, who was now in charge of the crime scene, took the photographer Desmond Chair through the scene and pointed out certain things that he wanted to have photographed. Then, Thereafter, Cher worked out and planned a route to follow through the flat in order to shoot the crime scene video uh, so as to avoid bumping into things and to disturb any evidence, such as, for example, blood spatter. Then he taped the crime scene video and he took some crime scene photos. Now I'm going to show an edited version of the crime scene video. It's about 15 minutes long. You may see short flashes of Inga's bloodied hair and of her knees, and you will see a lot of blood spatter. If you may find this disturbing and upsetting, then please do not watch the video and skip over it. So this is Inspector Desmond Cher entering the apartment. So Inga's body is in a couch there. Notice the security phone above the picture on the wall. And the crime scene tape tied to the faucet of the kitchen sink. Here you can see uh, Inga's car keys, glasses, and a cell phone. And right underneath the handbag. And inside you, there will be a wallet and a receipt for the steers cheeseburgers you bought. It's not so visible in the video.
Those are the curtains of the balcony door. Here you see the blood spat between the couch and the coffee table. Notice the clean area to the left between the couch and the blood drops. That's a shadow area which we will talk about later. There are also some drops on the table. And that is the DVD holder and uh, Inga's drinking glass with a straw in. Now, according to her mother, she always drank with a straw, without exception. Some blood better against the wall. And on the couch, and a blood pool at the bottom where blood dripped from Inga's hair. You can see all the blood drops on the little table here, and also in the lampshade. That's the magazine Inga was reading at the time. Uh, there's a big uh, blood drop there on that page. And then blood drop leading to the bathroom. That is the window for which uh, Prince and Nell looked for discarded weapons. And that's the towel with which the murder weapon was cleaned. And you can see uh, strands of hair caught in it, long pieces of hair. And there is the infamous blood mark, which we will discuss in great detail in another episode.
Now that's focusing in on the hair. Right there. And there's another one on the inside. The dark mark you see there, that's blood. And then some used tissues in the in the waste bin. So this is the second bedroom which Inga used as an office. You can see it is not too tidy. And that there is Inga's laptop. Now they're heading into Inga's bedroom. You'll notice that the bed has been pushed away from the wall. We believe that that was done so that the perpetrator could get a better view through the window to see if the coast was clear before leaving. We're not sure what happened with the suitcase and why it is in that condition. Now, as mentioned before, uh, Superintendent Neville De Pierre from the Serious Violent Crime Unit in Bishop Labus got called out to the crime scene. And when he arrived, he met with the most senior officer on the scene at the time, Superintendent, uh, Senior Superintendent Perry. And he gave uh, De Pierre an update in the situation and what was going on. Then the peer wanted to go to the apartment to see the crime scene for himself, but when he got there, 
the crime scene investigators were busy, Swartz, Scher and Matthias, and they told the beer uh, that he could not enter the flat. He then went downstairs to, to wait there. Now, sometime later, the beer did enter the flat for a short period of time, about 30 seconds, uh, because they requested him to remove the DVD from the DVD player. Now, apparently, he had a similar DVD player at home and he knew how to operate it. And the DVD disc, he just placed down on a coffee table. Now, when Captain Bruce Bartholomew arrived at about 12.45, quarter to one in the morning, he met with Neville de Beer outside in the parking area, who then showed him up to the flat. And when he got to the flat, the crime scene investigators were already in there. And at the time, Desmond Sher has already done the video and he was busy taking crime scene photographs. Bartholomew then took control of the crime scene. He was the most senior crime scene investigator there. And he asked all the officers that were standing in the kitchen area behind the crime scene tape to leave the flat. And then in consultation with Constable Swartz, it was decided to begin the search for fingerprints uh, later on that morning when the under natural light conditions. They decided not to do it right there and then because it was, it's, it's not a good idea to do fingerprinting in artificial light conditions. Swartz then left the crime scene to attend to other matters. Uh, Bartholomew then called Superintendent Johannes Koch from the bio biological unit of the forensics laboratory uh, to conduct investigation of the blood spatter and the blood marks in the flat. Then Bartholomew used his electrostatic dust lifter in the area around the couch and the coffee table and in the bathroom to look for shoe prints. Now when you step with a shoe on the floor, it will leave a pattern in the microscopic dust particles. And the pattern in most cases will not be visible to the naked eye. Now with an electrostatic dust lifter, or rather an electrostatic dust lifter is a device that generate elect electrostatic energy and this then lifts the dust particles onto a thin mylar foam. And in doing so, uh, dust patterns made by a shoe will become visible. So if you look at this picture, uh, first you cover the area of where you suspect it to be uh, a shoe print with a thin mylar foam and you use this device to apply an electric current to it. And then you turn the foam over and apply oblique lighting to make the print visible. Now Bartholomew found several clear shoe prints. He then inspected the shoes of all the police officers that entered the flat and found that all the shoe prints were made by their shoes, except for one shoe print he found in the bathroom, which appeared to have been made by a sports shoe. Now, sometime later, uh, staff from the Stellenbosch morgue arrived to remove Inge's body. However, before Inge's body was removed, Bartholomew covered Inge's hands in envelopes in order to preserve any evidence that might be under her nails. Now, Superintendent Koch also asked this monsieur to take photos so he could mark the location of where he found specific pieces of evidence. Now this photo shows the blood mark on the bathroom floor. Now TC and TD indicate the location of hair and TE the location of a blood smear from which Koch took a sample. Now this photo shows a blood drop between the couch and the balcony door. Now, by studying the position and appearance of the blood pools and blood spatter, Koch concluded that Inge was attacked where she was found on a couch. In other words, the body, the body wasn't moved there from another location. Now, for example, look at these photos. You'll notice here a clean area to the left of this line. We call this a shadow area. It is clean because the couch was in the way of the blood spatter. And this illustrates how a shadow zone is formed. Now, Koch did not observe any significant cast of marks, as one would expect from a bloodied object swinging at high speed. But there are many variables at play. And in this case, Inga's hair would have been prevented, uh, would have prevented a lot of blood transfer to the object. 
However, there were some blood spatters that were found on the wall, uh, and on the floor, in the magazine, and the coffee table, but not very many. Now, in the bathroom, Cock uh, observed a bloody towel on the floor, and in this photo, PK and TL indicate the position of hair found on the floor underneath the sink. Throughout that morning, Cock collected the following items and put them in sealed evidence bags. The duvet cover from Inga's bedroom, a toilet paper found on the floor of the ensuite bathroom, hairs from the sink in the guest bathroom, sample of a blood from the guest bathroom sink, the bloody towel that we saw on the floor, hairs from the guest towel from the shower in the guest bathroom, the tissue in the garbage bin of the guest bathroom, and hair samples from the floor underneath the bathroom sink. Now, Bartholomew and Cock finished their investigation at about 4 a.m. and then they left. And as the officer in charge of the crime scene, Bartholomew locked the apartment and kept the key with him. Cock then placed seals on the door to prevent anyone from entering the flat. So that's all for today. Uh, that was part one. Part two will come out soon and followed by part three. Uh, there's still a lot of interesting information uh, to be revealed. And I hope to see you soon and uh, stay tuned. Thank you.